Okay. Um, first of all, I got to tell you, it's uh, I, I kind of sound like I'm playing Vegas here, but it's really I'm really glad to be here and see all you people. I was telling Chair uh, before uh, you know when I got here that the last panel I was on against my own uh, protestations was a, a panel on the um, the fallout from the G20 protests in Toronto. Now I have to ask first of all, is anybody at that panel? Oh, okay. Okay, so you're going to back me up when I when I tell them that they beat the crap out of me, right? Yeah, I took a few hits. Okay, so I you know I went in there and I thought I would tell all these stories about you know my anti nuke days back in the early '80s and the you know the virtues of nonviolent uh, protest and they beat the living crap out of me. So I really am glad to be here tonight among all of you. Um, uh, myths. Uh, uh, Jared will also back me up uh, when I say that uh, I, up until this morning, <laughs> I was still searching for material, um, and it's it's partly partly my fault. Uh, it's, it's the byproduct of a disorganized mind. But also, you know, the guy who moderates the panel uh, sets the assignment and then claims the first myth. So uh, <laughs> you know, like he, you know, and it was like really good. I mean, when he did so, I was playing catch up the whole time. Uh, so I, I thought I'm going to deal with two closely related uh, myths. The first myth is uh, that Manitobans uh, actually care about the election that's coming up. Uh, I think I I think that uh, I would like to think that Manitobans care about the election. I think Jared made excellent arguments about why you should care about the election. I think the empirical evidence is that we don't care about the election, and uh, we're going to do a little experiment here, try to recreate something we did in 2003. So. Uh, how many people voted in the 2007 provincial election? Put up your hands. Okay, now clearly you're not representative <laughs> of Manitoba. But let's say, well, no, but let, let's say you were, okay, uh, representative of Manitobans. Uh, basically, 25% of you in the room are dirty, rotten liars. <laughs> and it, this is quite remarkable that uh, we demonstrate uh, contempt for politics and public policy when it comes time to put our money where our mouth is, and that is when it comes time to vote. So in, in uh, 2003, for example, 54% of Manitobans showed up to vote. It was a 14% drop over the previous election, uh, one of the largest single year drops ever in the history of elect uh, turnout. And uh, we were so shocked because we had done all this polling with probe research, and we've got, you know, really strong intentions that historic levels of, you know, we're going to have a historic level of turnout somewhere between 67, 69 percent. Um, you know that it was going to be the biggest landslide ever uh, for the NDP in the in, in the history of NDP majority governments, and then 54 percent of people turned out. So, uh, you know, we were curious. Everybody was curious. So we sent probe back into the field and to specifically survey a thousand Manitobans on why they didn't vote. But of course, you have to test the theory, did you vote? Now, you know, we all know about polling, it's extremely sensitive, very scientific, it's weighted for age, for education, gender, ethnicity. I mean, you know, to get a thousand respondents, they may make 10,000 phone calls. So, I mean, this, is, this is a, was a quality sample. And when the results came back, 70% of people said they voted. <laughs> it is, uh, I mean, you know, like we publish quote polls, so you might expect me to defend Scott Mackay and, and, and his colleagues from the university that worked there. But really, it was, the poll was an outlier because we lied about it. Now, this creates a, a really interesting problem because what we have is a disengaged uh, populace who won't show up to vote, but is mortified that anybody thinks that they didn't show up to vote. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, like I've been asked to participate on a lot of panels about voter engagement and, you know, they talk about, you know, voting systems and, you know, the media and, and cynicism, whatever. I mean, you know, i got to tell you, like, I'm just so sick of it all. You know, like, the, there is so much evidence to the contrary that we're engaged in politics and public policy. I mean, if you take an unemployed 25-year-old university student living in his mother's basement and give him a laptop and a high-speed internet connection and a Blogspot account, what does he write about? He writes about politics and public policy. He writes about crime and what's going on in City Hall. This is what they voluntarily do. You know, 
go on Twitter. You know, look at the amount of uh, look at the amount of chatter about what's going on in politics and government and public policy. It does pale in you know in comparison to you know celebrity gossip. But you know, there's a very strong theme there. I mean, I get tremendous results on my blogs and my columns online where, you know, for the first time ever we're able to track views and whatever. I mean, the only person who consistently upholds me is Miss Lonely Hearts. <laughs> but she's been around doing it a lot longer than I have, so let's, you know, give her some credit there. Um, so, I mean, I have trouble resolving this. And, and this is why, in fact, I feel pretty confident in saying that, you know, this idea that Manitobans care about politics, I think they do, but they, they, they betray that notion. They add the myth to it by not showing up to vote. And, and Jared and I were talking about this ahead of time. I mean, the thing that I'm really concerned about is that, you know, we saw in the municipal elections last fall across the country, a, like a national movement back to the polls. I mean, you were looking at, like in Calgary, a third of registered voters had voted in the previous municipal election, and they went back up to almost 60%. I mean, this is a remarkable rebound, and, you know, uh, like, it, it speaks well of the nation's level of engagement, that maybe at all levels of government, they're ready to show up. Toronto comes along, 59%, right? They were down at 41% or something, 59%. Really shows up well. We were down, in, I think, in the low 40s, around 40%. We came in at 51, I think. Uh, now, it's only a small, like, some may argue it's a small difference, but you know what? It, it is significant in the fact that we interrupted the trend. And really, there was a strong narrative in the, in the election. Uh, fairly engaged media. There was really no excuse not to come out and vote. Uh, even though uh, the challenger really did not put in a good effort the last two weeks of the campaign. There was, as I said, a strong narrative, contrast between the candidates. I mean, there was everything that you could ever possibly want. One candidate wanted to raise your taxes. The other one said, he, well, he at least at that time believed he didn't. And I think he's come to a different idea now, but we'll find out in a couple of weeks. So, there's no excuse for it, except the fact that we consistently seem to uh, do things that betrays the idea that we care about elections. And in fact, I mean, I think you said we were, what, consistently third or fourth lowest, you know, in the country. I mean, if things don't pick up, I mean, I think we will be lowest in, in the country. And, and that's, you know, not good for people like me necessarily. So that kind of dovetails into my second myth, which is that the media cares. Uh, about elections and politics. And uh, I, I'm going to suggest to you that that's a myth. And part of it is driven by economics of uh, news media. Uh, thanks to uh, how many people here get the paper delivered at home? Okay, well, you're not representing. <laughs> <laughs> but God bless. So, uh, uh, but, you know, the problem is like fewer and fewer people uh, subscribe to a newspaper. So you can imagine how much patience I have to listen to people complain about how we don't have a Sunday paper anymore. Like it was our idea not to have a Sunday paper. <laughs> like, you know, you gotta be nuts to think that journalists, which who are, you know, naturally for votes, would want less space <laughs> uh, to express themselves. So, uh, you know, it, it, uh, the economics of it are, are becoming more and more difficult. On the other hand, uh, what we have uh, is uh, more people read our stories now than ever before. It's this weird, uh, sort of situation. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to spend three weeks on a Canadian warship chasing Somali pirates. I was the only Canadian print reporter on board and, and our first weekend we nailed two Somali pirate skiffs at perfect time in the news cycle, even with the time difference, to hit all the Saturday papers. And so uh, it appeared in our paper, it appeared on our website, we contribute copy to what was then the CanWest Global Chain. So it appeared in every one of the CanWest Global newspapers across the country, National Post, and Canada.com. So when I came back, um, I had lunch with David Asper, and I, I asked him, so conservatively, what kind of an audience did we get? Uh, somewhere between four and five million people read the story. Now, the, the, even the mere thought of that five years earlier was unheard of. So uh, why, though, is there less political reporting? Political reporting takes a lot of time. It takes a great investment uh, in learning uh, not just the issues but the people, and and we just we don't have that anymore. Uh, very quick anecdote because I'm sure I'm getting close. 2003 election. Gary Durer loves Fridays for election. I don't know what it is about a Friday. He loves to get to hit the weekend and then his opponents were dead by Monday. 
uh, tradition, and it's true actually. Um, so uh, Fort Erie Community Club does the big launch, immediately drives out to the Simplot plant near Portage, does a photo op, and then this is where you separate the hardcore political reporters from, you know, the pretenders. So there were so, there, I was the only one that was headed west with the Premier for five days of West Man and Northern campaign. The only one. There were 50 journalists at the, new, at the photo op. The only one who left. And in fact, because there was only me and my photographer, they told us to leave the car and we rode in Gary Dewar's van. <laughs> we paid for our portion of the gas. Uh, but, you know, so this, you know, the, the whole idea of, you know, the leader's bus and then the bus full of reporters, you know, following close behind, um, you know, that's a myth now. Certainly is in provincial elections. It, it's, it's still the reality in, in federal elections. Although it's getting into the 50, 60 grand territory, 50, 60 thousand dollars to put a single reporter on a bus and an airplane with a leader for an entire federal campaign. So the sheer economics of it as well are, are working against us doing that. And I don't think that's actually a mistake when you think about it. Um, so, uh, you know, there is consume, consumer trends and news are driving uh, convincing news organizations to spend less time uh, publishing uh, material or broadcasting material on politics and public policy. There are fewer reporters doing full-time work. Uh, I kind of unloaded on some of them at the State of the City uh, address by pointing out that, oh, I'm already over. Anyways, <laughs> if anybody wants to know what I had to say about people in the rest of the media, you can ask me after. Thank you.